Thank you very much. Uh, uh, delighted to be here. Uh, and and uh, I, uh, I, I thought I would approach this problem a little bit systemically. Uh, uh, systemically, both from the standpoint of what's actually going on in the ground in uh, Iraq and Syria and the uh, uh, regions uh, of the Arab world that are in turmoil presently, sort of related also to the way that uh, uh, the West uh, both uh, approached this problem with a little bit of a reference to uh, Ukraine as well, uh, before sort of talking about the issues that we need to resolve. So first of all, I'm not really into the blame game uh, which seizes Washington whenever some new crisis happens, like who's responsible? Is it the president? Is it the last president? Is it uh, one thing or another? But I think that there are some lessons we can draw from the present circumstances in, shall we say, Mesopotamia. Um, one is, and this also applies to Ukraine, which is that, that problems ignored don't go away. In fact, problems ignored get worse. We saw this um, uh, uh, with respect to uh, Ukraine, of course, as we've talked about over the past uh, day and a half. And we, we certainly have seen this uh, with respect to the Syrian, uh, 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 shall we say, revolution, or would-be revolution that started in 2000, 2011. The second lesson I would say is that neighbors matter, right? Um, uh, I once was at a dinner with uh, uh, Mam Jalal Talabani, uh, my early days in Iraq, um, and I was pushing the sort of U.S. Uh, uh, approach at the time, which was, you know, you really uh, sh should limit the influence of Iran. They don't have your best interests at heart, et cetera, et cetera. And Mam Jalal looked at me and he said, Mr. Reese, let me tell you something. You can choose your friends, but you cannot choose your neighbors. And, and Iran is our neighbor. We must deal with them. And so neighbors really, really matter. The third kind of lesson uh, that I think is, uh, is relevant to Romania is it, it contemplates its own security posture and preparations for the future, which is that security, you know, back in the Cold War, it was so simple. Now the complexities are enormous, and you can just see in the last decade. 9-11 happened. We realized that we had very poor uh, strategy and operations in counterterrorism. Uh, so then we took action in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, we realized that we really didn't have any relevant or up-to-date strategies for counterinsurgency. Uh, and uh, we, a lesson reinforced uh, in Iraq, and we also learned that we didn't know how to do nation building. Uh, and so then this the latest problem happens in Syria, and we realize we have no conception of how to do pro-insurgency. So say you got some insurgents you like, how do you support them? And in, in particular, how do you support them in a situation where they're not the only insurgents, they're one of many insurgents? And actually, this is not so rare. You see this in Congo, you see this in the Philippines, where there are insurgencies against weak central states, and they fight each other as much as they fight uh, others. And finally, more recently, especially with respect to ISIS uh, and with respect to Ukraine, we learned that we don't have a strategy for hybrid warfare. Hybrid warfare where the, um, uh, the, 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 the adversaries are unacknowledged, covert, uh, stateless, but uh, seizing territory. So what do you do when a stateless body seizes territory? Do you, uh, do you act? Do you not act? How do you act? And how do you uh, engage all of the elements uh, of, uh, of the new revolution in military affairs, UAVs and cyber and, and so forth? So what to do in this, in this situation? And I'll let Kurt talk uh, uh, somewhat more about ISIS particularly, although they are uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a force with, uh, with a, a fierce uh, uh, both religious thrust, the Sharia law, un, you know, unprobed depths of inhumanity in, in the way that they approach it. It's sort of the challenge that kind of wraps up all of the challenges that we've had uh, in dealing with terrorism and in dealing with sort of Nazism and every other aspect all in one kind of perfect storm of an adversary. Um, I think, uh, here's, here's what I'd say just to start out the conversation. I think Western democracies, 
need to throw out the idea of timetables. Uh, this is going to take a while, and if you have a timetable, that gives the adversary the advantage because they just have, they know what they have to do to wait you out. Uh, as a former trade negotiator, timetables are helpful. You never get down in a, in a civilized negotiation, you never get down to the bottom line unless you have a timetable. In war, timetables are not helpful. Two, I think we have to understand that all conflicts are essentially political. It's um, in our technocratic age, we tend to think that uh, it's a question of application of force. Uh, you know, it's a technical problem to be solved. And we found this in Iraq. We approached it as a technical problem and not as a political problem. You see it also in Afghanistan. This too is a political problem. A resolution uh, in Syria and Iraq will require a political uh, arrangement in both Damascus and uh, in, in Baghdad that sets up a sustainable relationship between the Sunnis and the Shia majority in Iraq and the other the Alawites and other minorities in, um, uh, in Damascus that all parties think is sustainable and serves their own interests. Um, I think also we've learned that uh, in this modern hybrid war that you face, propaganda and public information is critical. It is a, it is a force multiplier and if you get on the wrong side of it, you're in deep trouble and the people uh, don't understand why you're doing. Um, uh, we obviously made lots of mistakes thus far with respect to ISIS and, and, and the Syria-Iraq theater. We, uh, we ignored Syria for too long, as I mentioned out, uh, otherwise. We didn't squash or, or put a lot of pressure on Maliki and let him um, do terrible things. Um, and uh, we, uh, uh, <coughs> we don't have a coherent Kurdish strategy, uh, which is certainly um, uh, the case. So um, there are a lot of bad scenarios for the way this can turn out. Uh, I think there's only one, shall we say, good scenario, and it has uh, three elements uh, to uh, reestablishing uh, peace and security in this region, uh, which is so much in our interest. One, we need a capable, multi-sectarian government in Baghdad that makes good use of the very substantial funds that they have from, uh, from oil exports and can, uh, can achieve success on the battlefield, has the sort of combined armed capabilities of, uh, of responding to uh, the, the, the uh, adversary that they face. Two, we need a post-Assad, multi-sectarian government uh, in Syria. Uh, and one that preserves Russia's interests. Russia has this uh, uh, Navy base at Tartus. I don't think we'll get to a settlement unless we uh, find a way to uh, assure the Russians that they're not gonna get uh, turfed out of Tartus. And three, I think, and this is sometimes we like to think in Washington, this is a separate problem. I think we need a comprehensive and sustainable nuclear deal with the Iranians, uh, because the Iranians must be part of the solution in Mesopotamia rather than part of the problem. Uh, and uh, they, uh, th th there is a basis for uh, drawing them in if there's a nuclear solution, and then we lift the sanctions, and then they face uh, the prospect of substantial economic growth. That's an important part. Um, but that's a trifecta, getting those three things at once, very hard, odds very much against it. So it will require effective patient support uh, across U.S. administrations. It won't be over uh, with the term of the Obama administration. The next president has to buy into it. It requires uh, bringing on board and keeping on board the Arab allies, uh, the Saudis, the GCC, the uh, Jordanians. Uh, it requires leadership shall we say, in Washington and Baghdad in particular, and as I mentioned, working with Iran and Russia. Um, but unless we get these things done, we can't build the Silk Road. Thank you. I have a few questions to you um, following these statements. Um, the first one would be, uh, ultimately, um, you fight this both on the ground, both militarily, and now you have a coalition in place. Um, but you've mentioned neighbors, and one of the difficulty here is that uh, the, the, what unites the neighbors there is that um, ISIS appears to be the common enemy of very um, strikingly uh, different. Um, you had on one hand Iran, 
on the other, the Arab states. You have the United States and, and, and uh, the Western um, participants in the coalition effort against this is on the other the government of Syria and its supporters. So how do you deal with this complexity uh, when trying to, to come up with a joint strategy to address um, this? It's very hard. It's like one of the hardest uh, sort of theoretical diplomatic problems that we have seen in a very long time. Uh, in addition to the Arab states and, and Iran and of course, Western interests. You also have the interests of Turkey, which are somewhat uh, aligned, but also different. And indeed, the Kurds. Uh, in previous struggles that the, the coalition had in, in Iraq uh, against Sunni extremists, the Kurds were basically neutral. They, uh, they defended their area. But now, with uh, their action in Kirkuk and, and, uh, and their defense of the Yazidis, they're also uh, part of it. And one of the problems that we have, and you know, I agree with Kurt that, that you need to figure out a way uh, to play on the Syrian scene. I, I don't think Assad can be part of the solution to ISIS because uh, once you get Assad in the coalition or is supporting the coalition in some phases, you're going to lose a, a, a lot of players like the Saudis uh, and, and, the, and the Turks. Uh, but uh, you do need to, to manage uh, uh, essentially a, com a very complex situation and in some ways the challenge will be worst with success. As soon as you have success on ISIS, say you uh, wage effective economic warfare that undercuts the economic base of ISIS and let's say that the, uh, the Iraqi security forces get you know, leadership transfer and weapons and air cover and start to roll them back on the ground. The success is the biggest challenge because once you have success, then all of the other players, the, the, the broad coalition as, the, as they're calling it now, uh, the Iranians want to ensure Syrian dominance in Baghdad, which undercuts the alliance with the Sunnis. The, the Saudis want to want victory in, in in, uh, uh, in Syria, and it comes apart very quickly. The Kurds start talking about independence. Uh, so um, right now, the situation on the ground, uh, the challenges posed by ISIS, ISIS barbarism is so dire that everybody can agree that action needs to be taken against them. But um, it's one of these paradoxical situations where success will bring its own series of very serious problems. If you look at the history of what happened, um, the, the recent history um, of how uh, the international community, so to speak, in particular the Security Council, kind of mismanaged um, the, the, the Syrian crisis in its, all its, uh, its steps, um, you see players like China, for example, that technically doesn't have um, you know, a skin in this game. But at the same time, if you look at uh, Xinjiang and some of the, the, the fundamental challenge that the well-funded, structurally strong, uh, fundamentalist uh, um, um, Islamist movement can pose to many of the countries that have soft underbellies uh, in this respect, would kind of um, make an international co a wider international coalition easier and kind of create a, a common line through this extremely complex um, regional um, puzzle. Is that at all feasible? Uh, U.S. policy was based on that uh, idea. I mean, uh, uh, in the period of time, say from 2011 through uh, 2014, the first part of 2014, uh, our strategy was based uh, on trying to develop uh, a international consensus behind a political settlement the so-called Geneva, Geneva II processes. And uh, uh, the United States and I think the European Union partners spent a lot of time trying to convince the Chinese to get on board with the strategy. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Chinese uh, believed it to be better to stay away from engagement with the West. Um, maybe they don't fear the, the, maybe they didn't understand this, the potential a, 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 a sort of caliphate threat, a sort of global transnational threat that might ha that that 
evolved, and I completely agree with Kurt that ISIS is, a, 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 in many ways, a big creation of the Assad regime. The Assad regime, from the day that the, uh, the, 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 the demonstrations first started out, said that they were Islamic terrorists. And they weren't at the time, but he created what it is that he wanted by squashing the secularist, the moderate opposition, and, uh, and got what he wanted. But to go back to the bigger question, we did try. Uh, Chinese were not supportive of Security Council resolutions. The Chinese did not want to isolate the Russians for their own reasons, and it hasn't worked. It, it may be that if we can, I, I, I think that the secret to getting the Chinese to collaborate is to get the Russians uh, on board. Uh, and, and to get the Russians on board, we have to understand the Russians' deeper interests in the situation. And that wouldn't hurt because we also need their cooperation with the Iranians and the nuclear file. Um, but it's still a very, very difficult lift. On that note, two, because uh, we're running out of time, two practical questions. One related to, um, you've mentioned earlier that it's very important that Iraq functions as a, as a, as a coherent unit. Yesterday, we heard from, from George Friedman that for him, technically, Iraq stopped functioning as a state. Um, you've been on the ground. Uh, you've seen some of the tensions that go beyond just uh, um, um, the Kurdish northern Iraq and, and uh, the political turfs that we've seen emerge uh, in, in the last few years. Um, getting out of Iraq is pretty much about this. How do you get out of it? while creating um, enough stability with the new administration in Baghdad to kind of be able both to fight this and address the, the diverging needs of various um, factions and interest groups? Well, we actually got out once, uh, we're going back in. Uh, uh, it, it, but the, you mentioned the book that we recently wrote on that process. We tried to write a history of the way that the United States approached the withdrawal of military forces from Iraq. And, uh, in some ways, it's a great success. Uh, not realize that we brought out 50,000 troops spread all over the country with virtually no casualties. We handed over lots of uh, functions to the embassy. We've handed over functions to the Iraqis. And it's a technocratic matter in the midst of a conflict that was really quite amazing. Uh, uh, the point of our book, and uh, only being reinforced by the subsequent subsequent circumstances. The one thing we didn't think about explicitly in that withdrawal was the political impact of leaving. Uh, and the reason we didn't do it was a typical, if you will, technocratic reason was because that wasn't something being transferred. The civilian side of our presence in Iraq always had the leadership on the, on the political side. But uh, as a national challenge for us, we didn't think about those things. Now that we're going back in, uh, we need to understand that the problem, and, and the president does, the administration does. I'm not, I wouldn't criticize them here. They really very much understand it. And as they approached the problems of, of August and September, they very skillfully set the groundwork for the departure of, uh, of Nouri al-Maliki. Um, but it is, it, the, the, the first task has to be political. We have to create an effective state. Uh, in Iraq. I don't think it's impossible. It is not uh, an illiterate, uh, incompetent society. Iraqis are extremely sophisticated. They've run all kinds of different states over the last century. Um, uh, and what they need is support for a uh, inclusive, moderate, um, uh, multi-sectarian sharing of power. And they have enough resources to pull it off. It's a lot tougher to do that when the resources are short and going down. If they could only um, uh, get agreements uh, kind of across with the Sunnis and the Kurds uh, and the Shia on fair sharing of resources, there's plenty to go around. And that political, political economic uh, has to go hand in hand with strengthening the effectiveness of their security forces in order to make all this work.